Information security is one of the most important topics in technology today. Is your data secure? Bring Your Own Security Radio is here to help keep you up to date on the latest trends, software, and apps to make sure that your data stays secure. Bring Your Own Security Radio is about to begin. Here are your experts, Dave and Jason. That's right, I'm Dave. And I am Jason. And this is Bring Your Own Security Radio, the very first episode. Number one. Number one, baby. That's right. And and for those of you that have tuned in live, and even for those of you that might download later, how lucky are you that you found us? I mean, tonight's <laughs> guest is great. Jason and I are awesome. I don't know. I just want to tell you that uh, we're excited well, to... Awesome. Uh, I, well, I don't know. We're also awesome. Uh, it's, it's great. And officially, as of yesterday, Jason, my CISSP is official. It, I got my are, I got my email yesterday. I logged in last night to look at all the pretty flowers and stuff. And um, <laughs> I'm already mapping out my CPEs for the next uh, three years. So I am. And now you can see the uh, members only part of that now. That's right. And, you know, I'm I'm a little, I'm not as excited as I thought it would be. I thought there would be a little bit more in there, but uh, maybe I just haven't clicked all the links. And I, I was still. I haven't been through the whole site yet. It could be. I was a little drugged up. I had knee surgery yesterday. I was a little, uh, a little foggy when I was looking at it. And uh, anyway, enough of that. That's pretty awesome. But uh, bring your own security radio. We are here live Thursday nights, 9 o'clock Eastern, every Thursday. And almost every episode, we're going to have a guest. Jason, why don't you break the news of who our inaugural guest is? Okay. Our guest, his name is George Bailey. Uh, George Bailey is an information technology security professional with more than 17 years of experience in network security, remote access, wireless security, and digital forensics. Uh, George serves as a senior advisor uh, of security at PHA where he oversees and implements security solutions for the healthcare industry. So George and I actually got to meet uh, some time ago. His company did an engagement for the hospital system I work for to kind of come in and audit us. I had done an audit of our stuff uh, back in June, and our hospital wanted some external people to come in and see if I was a little too generous in my audit or if I was maybe a little too harsh about our audit uh, that I did. So um, just off air, we were talking, and it sounds like coming up in the next week or two, I should get some of my results back. So I'm going to bring George in to this conversation. Let's see if I can figure out the right buttons to press. George, are you there? Are you living? I'm here today. I am alive and well. Hey, Outstanding. Exam. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, it took five weeks for them to uh, officially award that, and I was getting a little antsy, but um, I'm even more antsy, though, about your report on our hospital system. Now, I get on these airwaves, George, and I talk a little smack about being pretty good at what I do, So, and my audit was pretty critical because I knew we had some flaws that I had to work on, but um, I think... I'm a little antsy about what you're going to tell me about our audit and uh, how bad we are because, you know, I, I talk a little smack now. So, so give it to me straight. Is am I going to be uh, am I going to be upset at what you're going to tell me? <laughs> well, just let me put it this way: you certainly will have a job to come to on Monday. I don't think I like that at all. Okay, well this uh, this this, this I tell you what, this was such a great episode. Good night, everybody. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, uh, it is uh, always here, good to be Dave, gainfully employed. You have a fairly large infrastructure that you have to to run. I don't think you're going to have any surprises in the report. Yeah, and that's, and yeah, that's probably something. not going to be as hard as, as you are on yourself because you know, although I spent a few days with your organization, I don't live it day in and day out, right? So I, I got to observe quite a bit. But you you know where all the skeletons are in the closet. Right? Yeah. And my job is to try to find those. And, and you know, your organization has been very transparent, so I think you're going to get a great analysis. Out of it. Good. Well, I'm definitely uh, excited to uh, to compare what I wrote down in July versus what uh, what you're going to write in January. So, um, But that's not the topic of tonight. Well, it kind of is a little bit because that's what we're here to talk about. We're talking about 
infosec and, and security and um, auditing and, and things like that. And um, I know that we have a whole bunch of questions that we wanted to <clears throat> to ask you. So while I'm uh, coughing or trying not to cough out loud, we'll let Jason kick, these, kick this off here a little bit, and uh, I'll see if I can clear my throat a little bit. Okay, so um, what I'm planning to do, especially this is the first episode, Muted. So, um, is start with an icebreaker question, which would be, <coughs> okay, George, what got you started in tech? Meaning, what was your first piece of tech that you used? Or, you know, was it a Commodore 64? Unmuted. Or something that, you know, you know, you may have put that um, one day. Or... It, 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 was, it was a Commodore 64. <laughs> it wasn't one that I owned. It was a neighbor's. Uh, the first tech that I owned was an Amiga, I want to say 128. Oh, nice. Uh, but I, I didn't really fall in love with technology until, you know, the Tandy series PCs, right? The, oh, uh, that know. first generation, Packer Bell, Tandy 1000 with a 10 meg <laughs> hard card in it. Oh, yes. Um, you know, this was, this was predates Windows 3.1.1 and... Uh, CLI all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were they were one of the first that had the uh, you know the PC clone thing going, that's for sure. Yeah, you know I come from a military family, so uh, it was discretional income was wasn't really superior. So you know when I got that first computer, it was like it was Christmas every day. <laughs> um, oh. Well, I will say this is that uh, no more questions like that because I happen to know that I'm older than both of you people. And oh, here we go. Yeah, you make me f- no, you make me feel worse than I already. So just shut the hell up. No, I'm kidding. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I kid. <laughs> All right. So George, tell us a little bit about. Uh, so we've been promoting you a little bit and Purdue. Tell us how Purdue Advisors is related to the University of Purdue and a little bit about what you guys are doing over there. Well, great question. Uh, Purdue Healthcare Advisors is, we're kind of an odd entity as, as it relates to the university. And from an academia you know, uh, institution, there, there's probably not a lot of places like us. Muted. So Purdue is a land-grant university. One of our core missions is to give back to the state of Indiana. And, and the way that we do that is through engagement. And about 30 years ago, a techno assistance program was established. And what that program allowed folks in Indiana to do is to come to the university with their difficult science, engineering, uh, manufacturing problems to get the best of the best in the subject matter expertise on their problems. Unmuted. And you know, about 15 years ago, a partnership between the Indiana Hospital Association and another couple other key players came to TAP techno census program and said, you know, we love what you're doing for science and engineering. Healthcare needs that exact same assistance. And so for about 15 years, we've been doing quality improvement and, and just being healthcare's partner in the state of Indiana. Hmm. And to that... And there's lots, thousands of organizations just here in Indiana that have went from paper to digital processes, and they quickly brought in all this infrastructure. And it's like, oh, well, what are we supposed to do with it now? Um, so, you know, my team, my service line, we're, we consider ourselves a boutique. Uh, we service, you know, I don't want to say every health system in Indiana, but we we partner with a great deal of covered entities in our state and, and starting to spread out in the Midwest and a few other few states that found out about us. And so my service line, we, we focus on compliance, HIPAA, security risk assessments, audit, penetration testing, you know, everything that if you're familiar with the HIPAA security rule and its specifications, we try to assist organizations in making their environment safer, secure, more reliable. Yeah, that's definitely, and we have, uh, and we have another other we have a number of other service lines within Purdue Healthcare Advisors, quality improvement, Lean Six Sigma, uh, other quality reporting, MIPS, QPS, you know, 
QC Medical Home, those sorts of services. But you guys, you guys are not just focused on healthcare, though, right? You have other consultants that are in other uh, verticals as well, correct? We do it, it, within the technical assistance program as a larger organization. Yes, we do. Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a there's a pharmacy staff that focuses on pharmacy services. There's the MEP, which is the Manufacturing Extension Center, which focuses purely on manufacturing advanced manufacturing, smart manufacturing, whatever the key manufacturing uh, you know, buzzwords are today. We've got folks that are um, – the folks that sit really in my office, we only focus healthcare. Gotcha. So, uh, tell me a little bit about um, the difference between – so I know because as a customer, we went looking for um, external auditors to, to help us out, and – some of the pricing was vastly different between them and what you guys charged us. So can you, can you speak a little bit to why that is and, and to how you guys can possibly benefit other healthcare systems if they're looking at pen testing and the other services that you guys offer? So we, being, being a land-grant university, we are non-for-profit cost recovery, So which means that I can't charge you – up a higher bill rate than what it takes to pay my overhead. You know, my overhead does include, you know, rent, facility, and technology, and, you know, my leadership and, and other things. But at the end of the day, you know, it's not my cost plus an additional $300 an hour for profit and reserve. It's what you pay is essentially what it takes for us to keep the lights on. Mm. Well, I can tell you that – well, I, it's, it's very different. I mean, I can tell you that it was significant and without getting into details and, and being embarrassing to anyone, um, some of the other organizations that we looked at um, – and then, of course, some of our management had history with you guys in the past from other facilities. They knew about you, which I did not. Um, but when we started seeing quotes and dollar signs, I thought, man, how did these guys do it for – that little bit of money. I mean, that was, it was amazing to see. So, um, hat, hats well, off. We were, no we're, state, we're state employees and, you know, academia has been known to not necessarily pay. Right. So when we think about our compensation as employees, if there's other benefits of working with the university that isn't in the form of a, an income. So, you know, our costs are generally lower. Well, it certainly shows up, and um, so far so good. Like we said earlier, until you actually show me the report that beats me down, it's been great working with you guys. But that might change in a week. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think when you when you get the report, Dave, you're you're going to even be you're going to be surprised of of the quality of the reporting, the quality of the analysis at the at the rate of pay that that your organization's paid, um, because I've. I, you know, I'm not to toot my own horn, but I have followed some of the big consulting firms. I follow some of the, the regional folks that, that play in Indiana that, you know, there are six figure plus projects and, you know, hands down, the clients are like, man, your report is so much more readable. It's actionable. It's something that I can actually take to my soup, you know, my leadership and not have to spend two weeks, you know, trans transcribing the geek talk for them. Yeah, that's what you run into a lot with 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 audits because you end up with this barrier that that you have on this side. You have all the people that do all the audits, and then you have somebody that's somewhat in the middle that's going to translate it to upper management. It's it's actually pretty key when you can just take those findings and then take them and put them in in uh, uh, C level wording rather than having it in security jargon. You know what I mean? That's that's, a, that's a good plus point. But what I wanted to ask you is, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you found yourself working there? Sure. I, I moved to Indiana in, in, in the early 90s to attend Purdue, of all places. Uh, computer science major. Um, nice. And, you know, one of the first jobs I took as, at, you know, as a out-of-state student trying to 
make up for out-of-state tuition. You know, I took a job uh, with the Engineering Computer Network, which is a fairly large IT shop on campus. They focus, they to do support for the engineering engineering schools. And you know, that I started out as a as a web developer in '93, and I come to the office in front of my in my Ultra Spark One monochrome <laughs> system, um, and and you know, do you, do Perl and HTD 1.1 coding. Oh, nice. You know, and that led its way to, you know, bigger and better projects and roles at the university. Uh, you know, when I graduated, um, I had I had a choice. Uh, you know, I, I got a teaching license, and I was going to go teach uh, computer programming in high school. And, you know, I had a job offer, and I also had a job offer for uh, a systems engineer role at the university. And... Um, you know, I'd always loved technology, and I said, you know what? I can always be a teacher. I, I may not get an opportunity um, to to support such a great institution like Purdue, you know, right out of the gate, my first real job. Yeah. So I, I did that for a couple of years, and, and this, this puts us to about, you know, 97, 98 time frame, and Nimda, Sasser, Melissa, I love you, you know, all of these viruses of the day and yeah. worms and other things. You know, put me in a very defensive mode, and that and that's when I fell in love with cyber. I'm like, you know, I I've, I've got colleagues that they're they're more of an offensive security person. Mm-hmm. I'm truly defensive. You know, I, I want to make sure that my organization, my my client, my data is is safe. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I, so I fell, in, I fell in love with sure. defensive computing. <clears throat> um, so I went back to school. I went to graduate school, and. Um, I took took a great deal of uh, cybersecurity classes. Graduated with a master's degree. At this point, I had left the university to go work for another institution in Indiana, doing security operational work and HIPAA security mm. work. Um, and I did that for not quite seven years. And this was right after um, the HIPAA security rule was being enforced. Uh, so it was a, sort of a timely move for me. And I did that for about seven years, and that was your typical security operations, right? Firewall, IDS. Yeah. So you're doing like analyst. You know, yeah, the full full technology stack. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So you didn't get much sleep, then, did you? No, right. And, you know, you're kind of <laughs> old school pager. Oh yeah. So this this was really this was before the smartphone was mm. was was as widely popular as it is today. So. You know, you'd end up getting a page, and you'd VPN in, and you'd have to, you know, look at firewall rules and look at the stem and see what. Back then, it was, uh, and this was before Splunk. We had, uh, oh. we were using RSA Envision, which oh, was one of the nice. first generation stems. Um, but great, great tool, right? Great environment. Yeah. And, and um, but, but I, I was getting close to finishing a PhD in in cybersecurity. So, and I was still living in Lafayette, commuting to Indianapolis every day. So I, you know, I decided I'm gonna this role that I'm currently in at Purdue opened up, um, and this was this was, you know, summer of 2011. So I moved back to Lafayette, moved back to Purdue, thinking, hey, I'm gonna finish out this PhD, I'm gonna I'm gonna rock this healthcare gig, and and it's gonna lead to bigger and better things. And you know what I I, I had never been what I would consider an external consultant before. So when I came back to Purdue. I really redefined myself because I was an internal IT guy, internal security guy, bit of an introvert, and I had to become extroverted because I was immediately thrown into organizations that had security problems. And you know, you can't be the security analyst sitting in a dark room looking at logs. You have oh, to absolutely. communicate. You've got to get in front of people. And and so, and and I treated it like it was my own business. You know, we when I started in 2011, we were, we were doing a lot of grant work. So we were federally funded to to basically help uh, 3,000 providers in Indiana, and that, that equated to about um, 250 organizations, all the way from your single doc practice up to you know fairly large health systems. So you know most of the work was was already defined for me. But my goal was, hey, we we have a great cost model. We can help a lot more organizations that don't qualify for grant funding, 
and that's and that's what we did, right? So I I kind of helped lead the effort of building our our fee for service model, um, which brought me to Dave's organization uh, and many like his. Um, and since 2011, I've I've just been bouncing around the Midwest. I'm trying to improve healthcare security, uh, one client at a time. Right on. Yeah. Hey, before we go any further, I just want to jump in and say, um, you know, again, remind everybody that you're listening to George Bailey from Purdue Healthcare uh, Advisors out of uh, the University of Purdue in Indiana. This is Bring Your Own Security Radio, and it's our first episode. So, uh, again, we're tw- 20 minutes into the first thing, and I think Jason and I wrote down like 50 questions, and I think we've asked three. Um, so it's, it's clear that we probably need George for about three episodes to ask him (laughs) everything that we even considered asking. But, um, so George, I'm going to ask kind of two questions in one because of the, the new Intel, uh, chip risk, uh, that we've all seen over the last few days, the, the meltdown and, and, um, so for as much as you can, I, I know that you don't want to give away all your secret sauce, but can you kind of tell everybody a little bit about what an engagement with an organization like yours might look like? What What is it that you would come in and do? I mean, I know it, but maybe others don't. Um, but also, because of this uh, this new intel risk with this meltdown, talk a little bit about how maybe you would identify somebody – is at risk for that particular uh, problem? Well, so an engagement really depends on the size and the risk appetite of an organization. Because most of our projects are all fixed cost. So, you know, unless you're a really big organization or you're a really small organization, you know, one project is going to cost about the same. And we anticipate on site that, you know, there's a bit of administrative work, right? So we interview, just question, 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 right? Because we need to, we need to understand culture, we need to understand policies, procedures, administrative controls, um, you know, any sort of previous findings, any incidents. All the so slow down. the soft side of security, as I call it, um, and then there's there's a bit of physical piece, right? Because our, a lot of our framework maps to the HIPAA security rule, and there are physical security specifications that, that organizations have to deal with. So, you know, if we're going to audit you and we want your analysis report to to stand up to an OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, one of their reviews, we want to make sure that we look at you physically and, you know, looking at technology placement, uh, physical flow of traffic, and, you know, and, and, and sometimes it boils down to, how are you securing your sample meds if you're a small clinic? Because that may be the only motivator that brings someone to burglarize your clinic. And when they're in there looking in your sample meds thinking there's something good, there never is, by the way. Mm. But once they're in your clinic, they're going to walk off with a laptop. They're going to walk off with an EKG machine. They're going to walk off with something with data. So there's the soft side of security. We look at administrative control. There's the physical piece. And then there's a whole gamut of technical things that – that we would love to do with clients. Some clients let us just do anything and everything that we want. And, and other clients are like, you know, the ones that are either don't quite understand the value of, you know, internal vulnerability scans, password hygiene assessment, um, you know, just walking up to a random BC and putting in um, a rooted but benign USB stick, right, making sure that, you know, if, if you've got a PC – and it's someone accessible to the public, what could an adversary do? Um, and when you run into those limitations, work, what do you do when you run into those limitations, though? Because I know that you'll run into people that aren't very forthcoming sometimes. Like they're scared they're going to find something, or you know, you run into staff, like you run into your, like, um, your IT staff that are not very – you know, forthcoming with answers, like if you're going to interview folks, uh, you know, how, so, do you, how do you approach that? You know, I was just talking with a, a colleague in the office yesterday, and, and he was he was asking me about a, a client that, that he had that I had seen in previous years, and he asked me if, if I felt that they were info blocking, you know, that they were either giving fraudulent responses or kind of embellishing um, their responses. And I said, 
you know, I kind of got that too, but the the proof is in the pudding, right? So if, yep. if you tell me, oh, yeah, we have a great patch management strategy, and then, you know, I, I start to do a benchmark on, you know, a few random workstations, and I realize that you still have, you know, Adobe Flash version 2, and, and it's <laughs> yeah, 10 years old. Yeah, struts on your, on your servers, you know. Exactly. Um, <laughs> there's there's things that, you know, I'm willing to live with from a response, but ultimately the data I collect, the data I observe, that is what I consider authoritative. And I'd like to think that most folks in my faith would, would be the same. Um, you know, I don't be confrontational about it. I don't, I don't call them out and say, hey, you know what, I think there are sometimes people truly don't know what their settings are. They don't know what their posture is. And yeah. sometimes during the interview process and the combination of, Technical testing, either internal or external, you know, we can we can help educate them. What the, you know, a, a common question is, what is your Active Directory password policy? Mm-hmm. And people are like, oh, well, it's, it's you know, it's eight characters. We use AD default complexity lockouts are set at twelve. Blah blah blah. And then you know, I'll I'll log in and I'll just query the directory. It's like, nope, that's not what it is. <laughs> what? You serious? And and you know. And I don't think they meant to lie. It's not a lie. They just didn't know. Yeah. You know, a lot of these systems are legacy. They've inherited them from you know previous um, IT folks, and they just never questioned. And that's another interesting point right there is the fact that uh, when you have staff turnaround, you know, it's kind of how effective the question part of that is if you have a lot of people, if you have a lot of turnover in an organization. Um, so I guess it really does come down to the cold hard facts versus uh, asking the question. The question is just kind of the nice speak. Well, and so healthcare is very compliance oriented. So it's not unsurprising that you would walk into a, an organization that has fabulous policies. But then when you get down, you know, when you peel back the onion, mm-hmm. policies aren't implemented. They're not being enforced. And it's almost like they, you know, they they went to a security symposium, bought the policies, and just did a find and replace organization name. Yeah. yeah. So so talk a little bit about so like with this newest um, this newest Intel so melt, um, compromise, down, right? Okay. So how how would you find that? Well, that's not how I mean to say that. So if so, like you come to visit us. Um, a couple of months ago, um, and this this meltdown um, risk was not publicly uh, publicly acknowledged yet. So, so what would your advice be to somebody who maybe did an audit a few months ago, or nine months ago, or a year ago, but something like this comes out? How quickly? You know, something like this, do they, if they're behind a firewall, they think they're fairly well protected because of their risk assessment said they were fairly well protected. How urgent is, is it for them to go and look at this one issue and start doing updates and things like that? Where, where does this fall in line with we think we're safe versus something new just came out? Well, I, you know, it, it certainly has to be part of the risk management strategy. So as you know, any given week, these things pop up. You know, so a couple of summers ago was a good example when, when Heartbleed and um, you know the open SSL issues, and and I still in the poodle and the uh, the crack, I, I still see organizations that haven't moved on those or those vulnerabilities. So um, it it is it is important because this is one of those where it, it could mean remote code execution. And because it's compromising memory, right, there there is chance of sensitive data being there. Um, I don't I don't I haven't researched it enough yet uh, to know what the sophistication of the attack is. So it might be that yes, definitely put this on your roadmap. But is this a stop all you're doing at the moment and fix this? Um, you know, I'll probably know more by the end of the week next week as, as more reports and more research and findings come about about it. But um, I would say for organizations that have vulnerability management programs already in place, you know, look to those vendors, whether it's Tenable Nessus, whether it's Rapid7, Qualys, you know, 
faint, whatever your whatever your solution is, they likely will have a signature. You know, if you're able to do credential scans, you'll be able to touch every machine in your enterprise and to validate whether or not you either got the meltdown, which is an Intel, or the Spectre, which is a an ARM, an AMD variant of similar vulnerabilities. Um, U.S. has raised too, uh, yeah, detection yeah. tools as well. So if you're a small organization and you don't have the means to reach out and remotely touch your workstations, um, you know there are there are local executables that you could run, right? So you could probably get real crafty and do sort of a, a login script that would remotely uh, execute on your on your systems. What's scary in healthcare is that there are there are likely lots of things. That, that certainly have Intel, but are likely have ARM processors more likely that could be susceptible that aren't going to be on your patch list. Right? You're not going to think, oh, does my MRI machine, does it need to be patched? Mm. Well, yeah, it likely does, but there's probably not an avenue for you to patch it. Yeah, I think we see, we've been seeing a lot of that in specifically to our hospitals with the, um, the IV pumps. Um, and then we find that our vendor is actually very proactive in coming into our network through the you know approved methodology, but um, they keep our stuff patched pretty good compared to some of the risk that's been exposed over the last year. So yeah, you are right there about vendor vendor management of different devices. It's 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 a crapshoot as to whether some of this stuff was built you know in 2005 and the companies went out of business and. Machines cost half a million dollars, and nobody wants to spend that much to replace it, so they just deal with it. It's, it's definitely a, yep. a big risk. Right. We had a client ask us, you know, where where can I get to go in an old Windows XP machine ready to go because they have a, I don't know, I want to say it was a, a, a pulmonary function machine that, you know, they want to keep living. It, the device works fine, but... The, their motherboard on their XP system died, and, uh, and it's like, you know, you can't buy them from an OEM anymore. You, you might be able to get one on eBay, but the first thing you'd have to do is burn it down and rebuild it. And uh, you know, if you don't have the drivers for this particular, so it, it's not an easy problem. So. Yeah, no doubt about that. It, it's crazy. Um, all right, Jason, what, what's your next? What's so, uh, George? What what area of in your opinion, what area of IT security posture do you feel is most often ignored? Most often ignored. Uh, you know, you have you have it depends as as your tag. tag <laughs> oh, that's it one. Depends. Go ahead and count it. That's one. Mine, that's a... mine is. Wait, but is that two? Because you both said it. Sorry, sorry. Uh, it might be four or five. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, George. You know, <laughs> if 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 you know me and you you. For any length of time, you would have certainly hear me say isolation and segmentation. Yeah. You know, um, at least the industry that, that I'm focused in right now, you know, we, we have a security by firewall, right? So right. we've got the hard crunchy outside, and it's nice and chewy on the inside. Yeah. And we, and we don't do very robust egress filtering. So when you think about all those clients, you know, you know, Talking to the internet, communicating with its external applications and systems, you know, all those bad guys could ride back home on those sessions. And um, yep. you know, once they once they pwn a, a local workstation, you know, there, there's VLANs, you know, there's broadcast domains for separation, but all that traffic can route. Any client can talk to any client. Doesn't yep. matter what your trust level is. So, um, you know, certainly there are organizations that are more mature. But for the most part, the, the, what's being ignored is that if you get inside the inside interface of the firewall, you are trusted. And, and, yeah, that is, and I guess I guess I guess it leads to another thing where you deal with, well, you know, how do you want to do this? Do you want to fail open? Do you want to fail closed? You know, depending if you want to do an internal firewall for the data center, does it does it open fail? Does it does it uh? Does it close fail? You know that type of thing as well. Yeah, you know, and my my personal philosophy is that you need to have an internal security zone because mm -hmm. there are devices that 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 must be up all the time. 
and yeah. you know access to those devices is, is probably more important. But then there are devices where the integrity and the reliability of those and not so much access is more important. And you cannot guarantee those levels unless you can isolate and segment that you can watch, monitor, and defend that environment. So you would say that um, so the most often ignored is, is egress, is what's going out of our network, um, because we all look at who's trying to break in, but we're not looking at once you get in and you're trusted, what are you taking out away from us? Um, is that well, the bottom line? So, you know, again, looking at that exterior perimeter security posture, you know, folks are folks are really good about firewall. Folks mm-hmm. are good about putting intrusion detection, and, and some folks are even getting, you know, nice shiny UTMs that have prevention services built in, yep. which takes a lot of that noise out. But there's there's very little for the for most mid-sized organizations that are doing any sort of right. There's four aspects of, of network security that I think is very important that most people miss the boat on one aspect, right? One is to monitor the networks. Mm-hmm. You know, not just the uptime and then the, uh, the, the healthiness, but you know, you want to know what's going on, what traffic so is traversing your network. Basically, net flow. Yeah, net flow, absolutely, right? Um, net flow data, you, so you want statistical data, you want session data, and if you can afford it, full content data. Yeah. You know, maybe you have different retention periods for all three of those, but yep. all three of those play a particular role in incident response. Yeah. Right, so monitor data. A controlled network, so that goes back to that egress filtering strategy, segmentation, isolation, having security zones, um, you know, having a network that's minimized. Right? Just because you can support a BYOD and you, you allow anything and everything to connect, you really should ask yourself whether or not you should. So maybe yeah. there are certain segments that, that you would allow that on, but you know you shouldn't be able to you know, allow an employee connect the latest Android device and then have direct connectivity to your ERP or your EHR. Oh, yeah. or, no, that's not know. good. <laughs> um, and the next one is, uh, so we went with that. Monitor, we've got controlled, um, minimized, and, and current. All right, it goes back to patching, right? Mm-hmm. This meltdown thing, you got to be able to keep your environment up to date as, as, as quickly as practice. Yeah, patching is definitely number one. On my list as well. It's, it's um, number two on mine. No, well, on number my wish. one. Well, number two would be for me would be baselining, uh, and that would just be another part of that. So configuration is another thing too. Yep, I yeah. think part of that is the is the, uh, the controls, right? Knowing what services are running on what, and absolutely whenever there's a delta in that, you know about it. Yep. Well, that's a great lead into one of the next questions. So if you're coming up to a smaller or mid-sized company, um, George, that says, I've got half a million, three quarters of a million dollars, and we're going to do a refresh. Uh, and, and that's how they present what they're trying to do. Where Where's their best place to spend that money? Are they, are they spending it for a SIM? Are they looking at um, upgrading patch management capabilities. I mean, if they have a limited budget and they're not just going to rip and replace every single thing, if they ask you that question, where can I spend my money and get the most bang for my buck, what's your answer going to be? First and foremost, I'd probably go with uh, multi-factor authentication. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, it, it's 2018 and we are still all in change the passwords. We've got to get out of password management, Um, you know, and if that is something they've already addressed, then certainly holistic patch management. And I'm not just talking about the OS, right? I'm Mm -hmm. talking third party. I'm talking GPU level stuff, firmware, BIOS, all of your oddball devices, right? You need to know what you have in order to patch it, but you can't, you can't rely on, you know, Windows update or, WSUS or System Center to make sure you could get in your entire organization. Um, it may and it may be a hodgepodge. You might need two or three solutions to cover all of your critical assets. Uh, you know, and if, if you're small enough and you got money left over, start looking at network access control. That way, you know whatever's plugged in 
is trusted. And if, and if it's not trusted, you immediately put them on an isolated, segmented VLAN, and they're only getting Internet. Yep, that's good. And then my fourth would, would probably be network monitoring. You know, get bring that intrusion detection that we that we so love on the outside of our firewalls. Start to bring that into the inside of our network, so that when you know when prevention fails, which ultimately it will, um, because we're, we you know defenders are always playing catch up, and we you know bad guys only have to find one way in. Defenders have to defend everything. So you need to bring those monitoring services inside the network, right? Do do packet captures, bring up some, some snort or, or whatever your favorite IDS solution is. You know, maybe you're not stopping traffic, but you need to have a really good picture of what's going on. So um, wow that's so when you said two factor I really kind of caught me off guard because I think I'm not sure that I would have considered that an urgent. I mean, I consider it for me personally, like my social media and my public email accounts and things like that. I, I do FA everything. Um, internally in a healthcare, in our healthcare setting, we were so far behind the, the times that getting up to a 2FA capability um, would actually be a two or three year down the road thing for us, possibly. Uh, it may be a little quicker, but um, so it's interesting that you well, bring that up as, as a first first response with limited dollars yeah well so when you, when you think about what what the number one attack vector is at least in healthcare right now it's, it's phishing and, and social engineering so and people are going to continue to fall victim to phishing so you know multi-factors is, is one of the ways to essentially make phishing a, a moot point so someone gives you you know their, their password away you know that's half the equation um, and they still need to get the token or, you know, their badge or something, however you have that system implemented. So. Yeah, I think part of that, I think the other part of that, or at least the other half of that, would be um, security awareness training and actually educating people that you see something suspicious, have some suspicion about it. Yeah, and that's organically getting better. Um, but you're right. The and human it, element not can a, always be the most corruptible part, uh, and it's most. not the and it's not a spot in time, right? It's, yeah. it's I like how you said awareness program because it is very, yeah. it has to be continuous and it has to be repeatable. And yeah, it has to keep on living. Yep. yep. Yeah, we just at the hospital system. We actually just, I mean, days ago, finalized our contract for annual third party training, and um, and that, uh, um, as a stepped process it's not just here watch these few videos it's a large 60 question questionnaire um and then based on your answers you are then assigned some some videos to watch of course and then you have a quarterly kind of reassessment basis that's not as huge as the 60 and it also spreads out your knowledge so we hit the stuff that you're clearly weakest on now but then each quarter we add a piece that, okay, you weren't so weak on this, but this is kind of new that just came out, and we try to educate on that. And it includes posters that we can download and print off at the hospital. So things that we can visually uh, use to remind people. And uh, I know, George, when you came out to our facility, uh, we got so tickled by one simple thing. You went and found one of our computers that somebody did not uh, lock when they walked away from their laptop and you put your little card like basically I got gotcha you card um, you want to talk a little bit about that process real quick <laughs> sure so you know when we do physical reviews it, it's it has a multi facet right we, we want to educate because in some cases our escort in some cases we're not even escorted you know some clients are the you know will let us just do our thing. Um, but if we're escorted, sometimes it's not with a with an IT professional, and sometimes it's, it's certainly not with a security professional. So, you know, when we find workstations that are left open, um, you know, we take a moment and say, hey, this is why this is a bad deal, right? And w maybe we sit down and we show them what, what, what a casual adversary with very little time could do at least to that session, but 
you know, the way that we use file shares, you know, there's so much stuff available on the inside of the network that they don't think about. Um, so, you know, I have these cards printed up that says, hey, you know, secure your workstation when you walk away. Um, you know, contact your HIPAA security officer for more. For, you know, most, most people see that. It's like, oh, my goodness, am I in trouble? You know, uh, I, I never really hear the, the aftermath of it, so I don't know if, you know, if they actually call the HIPAA security officer and, and beg for forgiveness or um, – <laughs> I get a couple of emails. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a polite way to remind folks that you need to be diligent. Um, in, in environments where the screen locking is not automatic, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, constant reminders. Yeah. It's a friendly reminder. Well, and, and in, of, in our environment, we, we have too many auto login machines that we literally this week are – pulling out the auto login so if you were to audit us next week hopefully you wouldn't find any of those that we missed um so that we can start our automatic locking policies and things but um when you were there i'm not our official hipaa security officer although i'm the security administrator but i got emails based on your card like somebody from purdue said that they found my computer how did they get to me you know because of the one area in surgical that we were in Normally would not be not be where somebody could just freely roam um, because they can't get into that space. But so they're like, how did somebody from Purdue get back here and and catch us? So that was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, but if you call that the the stairwell, the back stairwell into surgery, it's any, wide open. any patron could walk down. Could, yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's, that's kind of a foolish question. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's partly why we. That was partly why we wanted to take you down that way so that you could see that if somebody was truly determined, um, they could get there. And we wanted it documented that it was an open avenue for, for any adversary. You know, another point I was going to bring up was uh, when you talk about when we talked about the um, um, security awareness is also like an acceptable use policy. So that way... You, you know, you won't have people using machines they weren't really intended for. <laughs> I think that's something that gets missed a little bit too, and uh, that's something. Oh, it, it absolutely a user does. Takes that and just goes with it. Or, or what happens is the acceptable use policy, if one exists, gets communicated at new hire time, and it's not part of the security awareness program. Right. And you know, are they going to remember what they agreed to five years ago? Um, when, when, when their credentials would allow them to use a workstation, and oh well, I've been on Facebook the last two years. Why is it a problem now? That's kind of true. thing. Uh, so it's again, if you're going to have policies, they they need to be communicated, acknowledged, and ultimately enforced. Yes, and that would come from management, upper management, that level. Oh yeah, absolutely. They have to agree on that, but that's part of enforcement of when things happen. So if an incident happens and it happened to be somebody being negligent, then, you know, you have a way to back that up. I mean, you know, I'm into another subject altogether. But well, no, and you're not really. I mean, it's, it's all a big piece. I mean, we, we certainly have had that problem and literally in the last 90 days, we are just rebuilding everything from the ground up. I mean, we have, almost ripped and replaced everything and by the time february rolls around every everything changes for our facilities so um having uh purdue advisors coming in and and taking a look at where we were kind of midstream really was great for us to be able to kind of assess what we thought were good ideas um going forward and comparative to where we were and to really kind of give that that supporting third-party uh, assurance that, yes, the things that your IT department thought of were good ideas, and yes, you need to continue supporting them, whether it be by policy or by giving them the correct amount of money to do so, and um, I think it's really going to make a difference for, for us, at least, and so hopefully other companies I think it, I think it will do just, that, too. Yeah. I, I, I spent three days on site with you folks, and they were kind of spread out over two weeks. And between the first visit and the third visit, culturally, I saw changes. Right, so I, you know, I'm not sure what the previous leadership and the cultural issues that that your organization was dealing with, 
but but I'm feeling pretty confident that this time next year they're going to be 180 you know degrees different than where you were when I saw you you know four weeks ago. Yeah, that's that's what I hope as well. Um, let's see, it is uh, wow, we it is 9:50 p.m. in the east. We've had George on for almost the entire show, and normally we reserve about 30 or 40 minutes for guests. So that's just how important this part of InfoSec really is. I mean, it's not so much of having all of your stuff and and putting all your your gadgets in the rack and and writing all these great written policies, but it's about doing them and then measuring those things that you're doing and and audit, auditing those things and and revamping what you missed or maybe you didn't realize you missed um this this part of it to me when we asked you like what's the most what's the one thing that's often missed i think it's this people put in their things in the rack and they turn them on and hit next 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 or maybe they they edit them to their own needs but they don't go back and and revisit what was good six eight months ago two years ago is no longer good you need to stay current and to me, that's where I think we fail mostly in IT is going back in and kind of understanding that we were maybe great a year ago and now we're behind the curve. Um, do you do you see it that way or am I am I off the mark here? No, I I, I would agree with you. You know, I, I over the holidays I reread an old text from two thousand five from Richard Belichick and you know, those best practices that he was preaching then, you know, 12 years ago that people were struggling with. Those are still issues today. Uh, you know, it's like we, we one step forward and we take two steps back. Um, so it's, it's definitely constant uh, because the threats are ever-changing. The technology is ever-expanding. You know, our network is, is now we have extra nets. We have, you know, you know the cloud is rebooting due to meltdowns. Right, Amazon and Azure are both saying they're they're rebooting large chunks of their cloud infrastructure because they've, they've been patched. So you know we put a lot of lot of resources, a lot of funding, and a lot of um, blind trust and faith into cloud computing. But now you get something like meltdown, and what you thought well, I was going to get you know 99% of the time now, well I've got an unexpected you know reboot, um, and and it's because you, people aren't reevaluating their situations you're right i i just gosh it's it's hard and and being in this field uh and being one of those um one of those people who who fell into that trap you know oh man i got this locked down we bought all this new thirty thousand hundred thousand dollar stuff you can't beat me now and um I, i certainly had to make sure that i didn't get trapped in that mindset myself so we've got just a few minutes left i think jason's going to kind of close it out with you leading you down this last path um and then at the end of this we're going to make sure that people know how to reach out to you how to get in touch with you george so if you want to start uh getting that contact info ready but uh jason what's Great. what's our last question i think all right george so uh, uh one point i wanted to try and discuss and i know it's we've got you know a matter of 10 minutes here um, so let's say you were going to run me through a 10 cent tour of the audit process, like from start to finish, uh, kind of the over the overview of what you would do as soon as you walk in the door for an audit. Say if you're going to do document documentation reviews, administrative controls, network architecture, vulnerability analysis, that type of thing. So if you are an organization that has policies, uh, whether those are, you know, compliancy policies, uh, security policies, employees acceptable use policies, you know, I generally don't waste the client's time reading those, digesting those on site. So generally, I try to request them ahead of time or reach out to the client and, you know, please formulate anything that you see is, is of value, right? And it may not have anything to do with information security. It could be it could be that the, the way that they, um, you know, authorize PTO, yeah. but but I want them to understand that, you know, it it could be related, and don't feel, don't feel like you're going to burden me or, or or this project with documentation because what that helps me understand is, 
have you thought about the multitude of problems? Yeah. All right. So, um, but basically, the first thing on site is you know, kind of meet the key players, the sponsors of the, of the projects. And, and an administrative interview is what I call it, and, and that that can take anywhere from three to four hours. And I like to cover eleven different domains, all the way from the security program roles and responsibilities through um, policy, training, personnel, physical, logical, uh, operational security, incident yeah. response, disaster recovery. Um, so we cover those 11 domains, um, after which there's some physical stuff. Um, depending on if, if, if an organization has opted for external or phishing or, or um, medical device security review. So it really depends on what a la carte things they've purchased. Yeah. Uh, but if it's if it's just a if it's just a run in the mill risk analysis, you know, we'll cover those eleven domains. We'll do some physical touching of the of the environment, um, and then we'll do a, a gamut of technical tests depending on the sophistication uh, of the environment. And those generally would be SysCat benchmarks. So looking at the yeah. you, know, you know CI security, right? They make the twenty critical controls recommendations. Yeah. Where they have these wonderful guides on how well you can configure your, you know, anything and everything in your environment. So, so we you use that as a base. Do you run use that as a base on particular systems? Do you just target some systems and run them on those systems? So, or? Um, you know, we I like to do as many as I can physically get done. Yeah. But generally, domain controllers. Yeah. Um, you know, a sample. I want to do one of every operating system if it's yeah. practical. Right. Um, domain controllers. Uh, workstations. If, you, if you've got a critical system, ERP, EHR, that that you have access, that you feel comfortable running uh, an application on the console, you know, try to capture that as well. I've got some custom scripts that I've written and tweaked over the years, which tells me a great deal about an endpoint. You know, I'll run those. Um, are these uh, network are the, the scripts and such that you're running? Um, is there any concern about liability or anything when you deal with those types of scripts where are these non non intrusive scripts where you're just running like like uh g p result or you know something like that yeah they're they're pretty non invasive so okay. for the most part they're gonna they're gonna capture some g p o s they're gonna capture um you know if you've got null sessions enabled in your environment anywhere it's yeah. gonna go out there and it's gonna enumerate some directories and populate some groups for me. So I know, right, if you tell me, yeah, we've got our domain admins group locked down, my yeah. scripts will tell me the truth. Um, and then, uh, you know, network security scans. Yeah. I, I I personally use uh, Nessus, but we, you know, we have a variety of solutions Good that tool. we use. Pardon me? Good tool, man. I've used it for about 10 years. Yeah, you know, and, you know, the reporting... I, I'm not necessarily a tenable fanboy. The reporting yeah. isn't the greatest, but it, it's a pretty rock solid scanner. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I, so, no doubt. Um, All right, guys. Well, look here. We got about a minute and a half left total. So, uh, George, real quick, so, so after how, all how can that, people reach you know, out to you? Let, let's get to the point before we run out of any time. If they're trying to find you or want you guys to come out and, and take a look or take an audit, how are they going to get in touch with you guys? Well, they can find our website at https colon slash slash pha dot purdue dot edu. That's pha dot p u r d u e dot edu. If you want to reach out to me personally, you can email me at bailey g a b a i l e y g a at purdue dot edu. Awesome, and we do have well, those uh, linked phone. on our site too. So, oh, wonderful. Um, so, Jason, just real quickly, you. After all that on-site activity happens, and that can either, you know, if you're a small client, that's probably two days. If you're a big client, that's either, you know, three to six months, depending on how big you are and how many systems and the complexity of your environment. And then that boils, you know, we take all that back to the office, do a policy review, try to give recommendations on, on modernization of policy, boil all that technical data down into, you know, some, some core findings, and then produce a report for you. And then okay. we give all that raw technical data to our clients for their okay. use. All right, guys, that's it. We got 20 seconds left. We got to get out. George, I can't thank you enough, my man. Thank you so much. Uh, for the rest of you, please make sure you join us next week on Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, 
And, and if you need to reach out to George, you'll find all of his info on our site. Uh, I am Dave. He's Jason. I'm Jason. And we're out of here. Good night, everyone. I'm George. Thanks, Thank George. you, gentlemen. Thank you for listening to Bring Hold Your on, OTC Radio. Up. Join us every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a new episode. Find us on Facebook and on Twitter at BYOS Radio. Or find us on the web at bringyourownsecurity.net. Safe browsing, everyone.